Hey guys, so now I want to go a little bit more in depth on matrix multiplication and related subjects like that. And eventually we'll get to determinants and inverses. But the way I'm going to do this is a little bit different than how Max does it. Max talks about rudimentary linear algebra, the, the tools you need to pass your linear algebra course. But in this, this is what I call a deep dive videos deep dive videos in that we're going to go a lot more in depth into the material and really see the underlying structure of linear algebra and hopefully see the beauty of linear algebra through that. Linear algebra is a very rich and very deep mathematical theory. So I hope you guys will enjoy this. Now get ready because it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little harder than what you're used to, but I think we'll go very slowly and we'll work our way up to it. Okay. So Let's just start off really easy, okay? We have, let's say we have a linear system like this. AX, well, where's my pen? AX plus BY equals U. And we have CX plus DY equals V. And A, B, C, D, U, V, they're just real numbers for now, okay? So this is a linear system. And we know that to solve this system, we can rewrite it as a matrix equation, right? And we can rewrite it in the form as this. We can rewrite it as A, B, C, D. So this is our matrix times X, Y equals U, V, right? And then as you can see, you, I'm, I'm assuming you guys know how to multiply matrices by now. You, you multiply the row times the column and the row times the column, right? And the matrices have to match. So for example, this is a two by two matrix and this is a two by one matrix. So the inner dimensions have to match, okay? So we can call this matrix A, we can call this a vector X and we can call this a vector B. So AX equals B, the standard problem of linear algebra. And how do we solve this? Well, if A has an inverse, if it's defined, then we can say that x is just a inverse b, right? Okay, and so that's all good and everything, but that's the, that's a two-dimensional case, right? What if we want to generalize this to an n-dimensional case? So let me pick a different color here. So let's generalize this to n by n matrices. And the, what we're going to, for this, we're going to, invoke a new notation and what we're going to use is called index notation and this is going to be you guys are going to fall in love with this i'm telling you index notation in physics especially in relativity special and general relativity all physicists use index notations because it just makes your life so much easier you'll, you'll see what i'm talking about okay so let me sh let me show it to you like this Let's say I have a matrix M, and for now let's say it's two by two. Okay, so we can write the matrix as like this: M11, M12, M21, M22. And th these um, elements of the matrix denote the specific elements. So, for example, if I have M I J, okay, I would be the row of the matrix and J would be the column, okay? So for example, M11 denotes the first row and the first column, that's why it's right there. M22 denotes the second row and second column, that's why it's on the bottom right corner. So this is, this is what I mean by index notation, where we write the matrix not as M, but as Mij, and Mij is completely different than M. I want this to be clear. Mij refers to an element of the matrix, the ith row and the jth column of the matrix. All right. So I just wanted that to be clear. So now, why why am I showing you this? Well, it'll be clear soon. Let's say I want to multiply a matrix M times X, where X is a column matrix and M is just a is a square matrix. And let's say that's equal to U. All right, so let me just give an example of this. Let's say M is equal to one, zero, one, one, and X is equal to two, two. This is in the two by two case, right? So then U is equal to MX 
and that's equal to 1011 times 2, 2. And that's equal to, well, 2 on the top, and then we have 4 on the bottom, okay? So that's the way we do it in the two-dimensional case. But now let's say I give you an n-dimensional matrix and an n-dimensional column vector. We would have to do all this math, right? So this is what I want to show you guys. We can rewrite this equation right here. We can rewrite this in terms of our index notation that I just mentioned. And how do we do that? Well, it's going to look like this. Ui is equal to sum over j equals 1. In, in this case, is j equals 1 to 2. Just bear with me for a moment. Mij times u. Oops, sorry. Not u, but x, j. This is the index way of writing matrix multiplication. Okay, so why would you believe this? Well, let's see. For our case, it would be this, okay? So ui, again, it's not the same as u. ui is the ith element of u, okay? So let's say we want to know what u1 is. u1 would be this right here, the first row of u. So u1, if we just follow this, it would be the sum from j equals 1 to 2 of m1j times xj. And we have to sum j, right? So this would be m11 x1 plus m12 x2. Now, what is m11? Well, m11 is just this. Remember the first row, first column. So it's just 1 times x1. It's the first row of x, so 1 times 2, plus m12, first row, second column, 0, times x2 is 2. And, of course, that gives us 2, which is exactly what we have there. And we can follow the same procedure if we instead write a 2 here. Then this would be a 2, this would be a 2, and that would be a 2. And you will get 4 as your answer. So this is the way we do multiplication in our index notation. And the reason why it's so convenient is because we don't have to worry about multiplying the whole matrix and we can manipulate indices because indices are just numbers. Mij, this is an important point, Mij is just a real number. And we can manipulate numbers much better than we can manipulate matrices because we have to follow these rules with matrix multiplication, right? So that's why index notation is so much easier in that way. So again, ui equals sum, and this is for the n-dimensional case. So let's say we have an n-dimensional matrix. So we sum from j equals 1 to n, and then it'll be mij times uj. Oh, I keep messing up there. So times xj. Okay, I hope that's clear by, to you by now. If it's still not clear, just make your own x's and m matrices and multiply them out according to that formula, and you will see that it works out perfectly fine. Okay, okay. But now how do we multiply two matrices? This is a matrix times a vector. Same thing applies for a matrix, okay? So let's say we have a matrix P equals n times m, and these are both um, square matrices. How do we do this in our index notation? Well, pretty simply. P i k equals sum over j equals 1 to n of, now we have to be careful here. So it's going to be n i j times m j k. Okay. Notice the inner index. I mean, it's it's like the, the outer one of the first one times the inner is basically the inner one gets multiplied. Mul I mean, summed over, sorry. Summed over. And this makes sense. You can test it out for yourself. I'm not going to do it right now, but I'm just telling you a priori that this makes sense. Okay? So this is how do we multiply vectors, and this is how we multiply matrices. Now, what can we do from here? Well, let's define this matrix I. I, as we all know, is the identity matrix. Identity matrix. 
okay? And we're going to define the elements of i, 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 j. We're going to define it in terms of this symbol delta i, j, okay? And maybe some of you have seen this already. Maybe some of you have not. I'm just going to assume that we haven't seen it yet. This symbol right here is called the Kronecker, Kronecker delta, okay? And I'll show you exactly how it's defined right now. Let me pick a different color here, some nice blue. So delta ij is defined to be, every time I write three um, lines like that, that means it's defined to be, is defined to be 1 if i equals j, and 0 if i does not equal to j. OK? So for example, delta 2, 2 would be 1 because i equals j, delta 3, 3 is 1, but delta 2, 1 equals 0. Okay, these are some examples. Now this makes perfect sense because as we all know, the identity matrix is just 1 on the diagonal, right? So that's exactly, it's exactly the Kronecker delta. Okay, so now we can say something interesting, which is, you, probably, you guys probably all know this, but if we multiply the Kronecker delta, if we multiply the inverse, so let's say I want to, not the inverse, sorry, if we multiply the identity matrix times any matrix M, what does that give us? Well, you guys all know that gives you M because the identity matrix is basically like 1, right? But how do we prove this? Well, we use our index notation and we say this. The components of this, i, j, of i times m, we follow this multiplication rule. Remember this one? P, i, k equals sum over that. So we can write this like this. Sum and, oops, j equals 1 to, um, I don't want to use j. I need to use k. k equals 1 to n. And then we're going to have delta because delta is the elements of i. So delta i, k, and then m, k, j. And then this is just equal to m, i, k. Why? Because this guy is only non-zero when i equals k. So this is only non-zero, only non-zero when i equals k. And so that collapses this whole sum for when i equals k, it collapses it. k equals 2 and i equals 1, they don't work out. Only when k equals 2 and i equals 2, they work out. So only when i equals k. So it basically collapses the sum to one number, which is just m i k. Because k is replaced with i. And j is, re oops, sorry. This should not be, um, this should not be k, this should be i, j. Because, um, because this collapses the sum, as I said, to only when i equals k. So k is replaced with i, just like that, and the j stays the same. So here we have a little short proof with our index notation that the identity matrix does nothing to the actual matrix. It just multiplies it by 1. All right? So now before we continue further in the next video, I want to establish a convention. It's actually called the Einstein summation convention. And what this convention says, so Einstein summation convention. And this convention is going to be really useful, especially for me, because I don't have to write the sums. So recall that we multiply the matrix. When we multiply the matrices from our multiplication rule, it will be P i k equals sum from j equals 1 to n of n i j times m j k, right? So now, look at this. This is actually very interesting. i and k are what are known as free indices. And what does free mean? No, this is not, this is not like the Emancipation Proclamation. Free indices mean that they are not summed over. So free indices are not summed over. And you can see this here because i and k 
are not summed over. But J over here is known as a dummy index. Dummy index. And the reason it's called a dummy index is because it doesn't matter what J is. I can make this a W for all I care, but it's the index that's being summed over. It doesn't matter what it is. I could call it alpha, beta. It's still summed over. I can rewrite this easily as sum from alpha equals 1 to n of n i alpha times m alpha k. It doesn't matter. It's being summed over. But i and k are very important. They're free indices. And they have to match from the right side over here to the left. It has to be the same amount on the left as on the right. Okay, And what Einstein's summation convention is, is that indices that are dummy indices that are summed over always appear two times. So we can get rid of this summation and just write ni alpha m alpha k. And because there's two of them, because we have alpha twice, we automatically know that they're going to be summed over. So that's the Einstein summation convention. Okay, so we'll get a little more in depth with this next time, but I just wanted to lay the groundwork of how to multiply matrices with the index notation and a couple neat um, with the identity we did and this Einstein summation convention. And next time we'll talk about determinants and inverses and we'll go into a little bit more of an eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay.